say so because I see a lot of priorities. Uh, from, uh, from the authorities in the region. So, and I think uh, I should extend to them a very warm welcome. It's a bit uh, unusually, it's a bit unusually chilly in Pretoria. It's, it's not like this. <laughs> but I hope the aircon will help us a little bit. Um, we have invited Professor Eleanor Fox uh, for this uh, <coughs> workshop um, with, with her colleague, uh, uh, Professor Harry Fresk, to talk to us really about uh, the intersection between competition policy and economic development, as well as the competition implications of creating the free trade areas, such as the Africa free trade zone, um, what has been happening at the Comesa, and how authorities can approach uh, competition uh, law in that context. <coughs> so there will be, she will uh, do a presentation for us to cover those issues. Maybe perhaps I should uh, briefly introduce to you Professor Eleanor Fox, whom I have asked for a very brief use profile because I think you are all familiar with <laughs> with her work and where she comes from. So if we have to take a full program, I think it will take a lot of time uh, going through what uh, Professor Fox has done. Uh, Professor Fox is the Professor of uh, Trade Regulation at the New York uh, University School of Law. She has advised uh, numerous younger antitrust jurisdictions, including South Africa, Egypt, Tanzania, the Gambia, Indonesia, Russia, Poland, and Hungary, as well as Comesa. She was awarded an inaugural Lifetime Achievement Award in 2011 by the Global Competition Review for substantial, lasting, and transformational impact on competition policy. Professor Fox has written widely in the field of competition policy, trade and regulation. Uh, let's maybe welcome Professor Paul. With Professor Fox, I think uh, as I've met uh, uh, Professor West for the first time uh, uh, this week. And uh, I think uh, Professor Pop Fox uh, picked from the cream of the crop in, the <laughs> in that faculty because we have had some engagements before, uh, you know, during the week and, and so forth. So Professor Fest is Professor of Law at the New York University uh, School of Law and co-director of the law school competition, innovation, and information law program. From 1999 to 2001, he served as the chief of the antitrust bureau of the office of the attorney general of the state of New York. <coughs> Professor first teaching interests include antitrust regulated industries, international and comparative antitrust, uh, business crime and in innovation policy. Professor First has written, written widely in the field of competition. Let's welcome Professor First. <laughs> and my name is Hadin Rajisus. I'm the acting deputy commissioner of the Competition Commission. And welcome to you all. And I hope you are going to have an engaging and sort of thought-provoking interactions with the two professors. I think we'll let them present to us what <coughs> the, the, the 
their perspectives are, but it's a very relaxed workshop. So we'll allow the professors to speak. We'll open it up for, for questions, remarks, and any views you might have on the topic. Uh, this, I think, will run until it's scheduled for, scheduled for three hours. We are 20 minutes late. I think we'll sort of finish around about uh, 12.30 to 1 p.m. Colleagues, I think over to you, Prof. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm going, yeah, I'm going to take the mic. You will need this mic. Oh, right. Yes. Okay, thank you very much, Andy. Thank you, Competition Commission. Um, um, thank you all for coming this morning. I know you have a big meeting also this afternoon. Just a second. Yeah, it looks like it's better. Yeah. What happened? This keeps popping up, and I say, no, I didn't want to change. And they say, yes, you do. When you're in my view, you want to change the color. Okay, good morning everybody. I'm really happy to be here. I see a lot of friends and perhaps we'll meet some new ones. And I know this is a really interesting group of people um, that I, I will say a few words, but you know a lot more on some of the areas that we will be talking about and we'll be really happy um, to hear your thoughts after I make some remarks and Harry will make some remarks and then we will have a question, answer, and discussion period. So my remarks today are in two different parts, but they're actually quite linked. One part of them is about the Sustainable Development Goals and the United Nations, the UN and the World Bank project uh, to continue the efforts on the Millennium Development Goals uh, to get the poorest people out of poverty and give them what they need to have a sustainable and good life. Uh, the second part is more on traditional trade and competition, uh, the kinds of issues that we hear and talk about all the time about um, the opening up of the world, the multitude of competition systems in the world, the clashes of the competition systems, and then the supranational organizations that are both trying to make the systems more compatible with each other, but also trying to give help on learning and capacity and bringing the agencies up to a very good level where they can spot the restraints and catch them. And my thesis and link between the two is the following, that these restraints on trade and competition are very disabling, very often, of the poorest people. And if these restraints and barriers can be knocked down, and if the competition agencies, as I know you do, have a consciousness of applying your law to help the poorest people and to knock down the worst barriers, um, you're going to find a very distinct link between the sustainable development goals, which are basically human rights goals, and the competition goals. And then there's another part to this problem, which is the following. Um, it's my perception, and I know it is a lot of people's perception, that if you're really interested in helping the poorest people out of their dire situation, you do it by human rights and not markets, and that markets are part of the problem, not the solution. 
And very often you will hear people saying, I don't want to hear about markets. I just want to help the people. So my proposition is that markets are an access to markets, access to markets, focusing on how you can make the markets work for the poorest people is a, very, a really critical goal that should be folded into, expressly folded into the millennium and the post-millennium development goals as a necessary tool uh, to help people out of deep poverty and up the ladder and participating in the economic system and giving them the dignity and empowerment that are all part of the goals. So if I am right, both about the importance of, am I too close to this, is this ringing back? Um, I don't know. I, I suppose they're good. Um, all right. If, if I'm right about the importance of markets and your work in spotting these worst restraints that hurt the poorest people and the importance of markets, I think we have a, 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 an education job to do uh, to that part of the human rights community that thinks that markets are the problem, not the solution. But it also means that in applying your law and looking for the worst restraints and applying your law, um, one has to be more generous than narrow in thinking about what is an abuse that hurts markets that hurt the poorest people. Okay, so back to my outline. Um, I want to give now a little timeline that fits more with thinking about traditional trade and competition. <coughs> and it's not just, though, the traditional trade and competition, but I will show you how even that timeline has a distinct link with the human rights, the enabling of the person as a human being to have a decent life with dignity. Um, I will do that sort of at the end of this part. And I, what I'm going to say is, um, what has the world unleashed with globalization? And has the globalization tended to make those who are well enabled to just make more money and empower them against the poorest people? Has globalization hurt the poorest people in any way? Um, you remember the Washington Consensus in the 90s, which really said, just make your markets work. Don't worry about distribution. If you worry about distribution, you're decreasing the size of the pie and making everybody worse off. And there was a backlash against the Washington Consensus, which actually gained traction to say, yeah, you've got to worry about imperfections in markets. You can't just say, let the market work. Um, it's a little, a lot more nuanced than that. The backlash, I would say, was solely on market grounds of how well markets work to deliver lowest prices, goods to consumers. Um, the backlash is a kind of lead in to millennium development goals, uh, which show you how you can really link making the poorest people better off by markets, but not if you have a Washington consensus view that all you have to do is unleash markets and everybody will be better off. So the timeline, which actually brings us all here today because uh, in view of globalization, you have an African Competition Forum, um, you have your three um, free trade areas in, I guess this is all but Western Africa, the three uh, that are overlapping and working for more coherence. This is all a result of bringing the world closer together through globalization. Um, for a timeline, if you went, I just mentioned this for a minute, if you went way, way back, um, and this is now first antitrust law, then trade law, and lower trade barriers. So um, US pioneered antitrust beginning in 1890, and at that time, US was really, for many years after that, until EU came along, um, US was really the one very visible enforcer of competition law 
which was to get prices down lower, to, to get rid of the cartels, get prices down lower, prevent blockages by private firms in markets, um, and make the market work. At that time, I mean, going way back, and for much more than half a century, uh, the U.S. competition law uh, was focused also on a kind of economic democracy and did care about those who were without power and not well off. Uh, there came a time when we reversed our paradigm. Uh, before that time, because I'm going to move really quickly to uh, European community adopts the Treaty of Rome in 1957. It goes into effect in 1958. And they, be, of course, Germany was there before that, and um, a very good model that worked some of its ideas into the European community competition law. So then you have these two very viable, robust competition laws. And the next really important thing that happened in the confines of my timeline is the fall of the Berlin Wall at the end of 1989, um, and that signaled the end of communism as Russia knew it, because uh, there are all sorts of communism, and compa command and control over markets. Um, in Russia, and then the satellite countries of Russia, Central and Eastern Europe, and as they went to markets, um, they also went to competition law to contain the markets, and then meanwhile, um, trade barriers had gone way down, right before the fall of the Berlin Wall and right after the fall of the Berlin Wall. And when, at the end of the Uruguay trade round, the barriers went way, way down, the whole world shrank, and companies were in tighter competition with each other, and we began to see several things. One was that cart world cartels arose and became really strong um, because the companies didn't, they found they had to compete across seas and they didn't like it. So many world cartels, and we're fighting that today because there are many incentives for world cartels. Cartels often pay if we're not careful about how we formulate and enforce competition law. Uh, so, so we saw many cartels, and we do still in the world, we saw a little bit of chaos um, with systems conflicting with each other, even if they're trying to do basically the same thing, and some gaps in the law, too, uh, because, for example, the way most of our laws are organized today, uh, each country is minding its own market, understandably so, if it's on its own, uh, so, for U.S., for example, Canada, I want to mention the Potash Cartel, Canada, same. Um, if a cartel hurts U.S., that's <coughs> going to be caught, almost surely. If it hurts somebody else, it won't be caught by our law. And there is, that's the gap problem. It might be felt. Uh, it might even be targeted at small developing countries that really don't have the wherewithal to protect themselves. So that's one of the gaps. So we have overlaps and we have gaps. And we also have a lack of vision from the top so huge mergers can happen that are good for the developed world but create buying power against small producers, say, of cocoa beans in Africa. And for the developed world, they say, not our problem, and for the country that's hurt, it's often not only the problem, but there's no way to be able to have the practical ability to enforce against it. Uh, so, with this unleashing of competition in the world, uh, we did, as I said, the, we did get what was called the Washington Consensus, which is the idea of advice from the developed to the developing countries, I mean, not just rules for ourselves, but from developed to developing countries to say, um, really just open your markets. In fact, that was very important. I mean, that was a message that was very important. I don't want to condemn that as a message of opening your markets, but like, just open your markets, everything will be fine. 
don't intervene very much after you do that. So sort of lay back if you're thinking of competition enforcement. If it's not a cartel, which uh, agreements among competitors uh, to raise prices, we can see the government intervention is both, if you know, if you find there's a cartel, the government intervention is, is easy. The government's not going to be messing things up um, by micro-engineering. And so we always put that to one side when we say free, free markets, because virtually every country recognizes cartels are harmful, raise prices. If you find the agreement, the rule of law is easy. So putting that to one side, the rule from Washington consensus was don't do very much else. The market will take care of itself. So that is a message that it turns out doesn't fit a lot of countries, especially a lot of countries that you are in where you actually have high barriers within the country uh, so that sometimes the markets aren't so free, sometimes they're controlled by a few families, um, sometimes uh, the, the ordinary person cannot pierce them. You need connections. Uh, you need the education. Of course, you need the food to begin with. You need the medical care, the schools, the education to begin with. Uh, but once the people are actually positioned so they could do well and they can do great on their merits, they find that they can't do anything on their merits because the market is blocked. And that's where there is this relationship um, to the development um, goals of the United Nations. Uh, so if you go back to the millennium, and I'm going to start with competition and development, and then the second part is competition and trade. Uh, if you go back to the millennium goals, these UN, they're adopted in 2000, and there's a new consciousness in the world, as there should have been all along, but a new consciousness of the, the billions of people in deep, deep poverty deprived even of food, and the children, one-third of the children, this is even today, still, uh, one-third of the children, one in every three, being malnourished, and they will actually be deprived of what they need for their bodies to grow and for them to have all of the capabilities to do what they were born with. That's a horrible statistic, and new consciousness uh, in about year 2000. So, year 2000 with the 2000 Millennium Development Goals, which was to have, cut in half, the number of people in poverty by 2015. So now we are here in 2015. And work has been done. Um, and I would say most of this work that has been done to lift people out of poverty has been by aid, by countries that are richer, um, granting aid in various ways to the countries that are very poor. And of course you know well that not all that money goes to the people who are the poorest, even though there's a huge contribution at one end. It doesn't always go to the people that need it. But some of it does, and a lot of human rights workers are working hard to make sure a huge amount does. Um, and through the effort of the Millennium Development Goals, people working together in various ways, um, a, a huge number of people were actually lifted out of poverty. Uh, what that really means is another question, because it can mean that people who were making under $1.25 parity pricing before are making a dollar thirty or a dollar fifty. I mean, so it's incremental as to what it means. It doesn't necessarily mean a huge shift, uh, but it means something. And and so some give their credit for lifting millions out of poverty, and some really were. Others actually were hurt. Um, food became more expensive. 
some of the poorest people were hurt, but many people were made better and somewhat better in an absolute sense. In a relative sense, that isn't true because of inequality of the distribution of wealth. And so those, and this you probably know well too, the inequality problem became more serious with that small percent on the top owning more of the world's assets and like 1% owns 40% of the world's assets and the rest owning um, their share of this much smaller piece of the pie. Um, so coming on to 2015, I'm sure you know this well, and I see some of you who were at the UNCTAD competition meeting in July. Um, the United Nations, I wasn't going to just leave it there, 2015 is going to be over and that's it, but uh, is en route to developing the Sustainable Development Goals. So first it was the MDGs and now it's the SDGs, and there are drafts that I suppose are pretty solid going to be adopted in September of this year on the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, this is what the World Bank says on sustainable development. The sustainable development goals, the way I read them and the background papers, go a bit further and sometimes market sympathetic. Um, I'm thinking of the market as a possible solution, but not in a very upfront way, because I still think that the aid is the more upfront way of thinking of the tools to solve the problem. Uh, but the Sustainable Development Goals papers, um, of course, talk about the deep systemic poverty, need for food, um, need for education, health care, etc., and the empowerment of people and the sustainability of the development and, for, and the inclusiveness of the development. Uh, so that means not only you get more money in your economy by the rich countries that can invest and take it out um, and create, it, it means it works against the image of richer countries invest, get money. That always helps. I mean, it does help create jobs. It does help create some opportunities, but it could increase the disparity in wealth. So Sustainable and inclusive development goals means bringing everybody up, if you can, onto the ladder so people do have a chance and more economic opportunity to engage in the economic life of the country. And that's where, although the papers don't seem to mention it too much, um, that's where there is a big link to markets because markets are the way uh, to tear down barriers and get people opportunity and keep them from not being fenced out by the power both of private firms and of governments. So this is what the World Bank says now. Um, we have now a new post-2015 development agenda. It's being designed. Today's global realities require that the proposed agenda be more ambitious and interconnected than its predecessor with the more comprehensive vision of development. The proposed SDG, Sustainable Development Goals, encourage every country to end poverty and enhance social and economic development. These goals will not be achieved with business as usual approach. I have a note at the bottom that most are envisioned to be achieved by aid, and I am envisioning that to be achieved, they must be achieved by your work, World Bank work, in tearing down barriers to help people have a free path on their marriage to enter, sustain, and grow in markets. And the message of the World Bank is not business as usual. So to me, this calls for a new consciousness of competition agencies to say, antitrust economics, competition economics and analysis is not just neutral. 
in the sense of the whole game is not about increasing aggregate welfare. Uh, you could talk about consumer welfare, or you could talk about total welfare, and I'm not drawing that line. But the traditional way of antitrust or competition economic thinking is what you're trying to do is increase aggregate welfare, and if you have, say it's an exclusionary restraint um, that doesn't decrease aggregate welfare, or it doesn't decrease aggregate consumer welfare, that's the end of the problem, and you don't look at distribution. Uh, who gets the gains and who loses? Uh, you don't look at the fact that through all of the freer trade, freer competition initiatives in the world, you know, it's true that those enabled and the richer countries and the more enabled corporations get a whole lot more of the gains of trade. And that has been called an irrelevant factor because sometimes, in fact often, that brings some of the less enabled people up a bit. Um, but it's not enough to say aggregate welfare only. We don't care who wins and who loses. And I'm talking about a broad sense. I'm not talking about micromanaging to say one person loses and we must feel so sorry for them. I'm really talking about markets. So I said, actually, what this slide says, and maybe a few more. I, oh, incidentally, the slides handed out were just slightly different because I made a few edits of them. Let me just try that. Okay. Uh, so what are the problems that stifle development and leave millions of people in developing countries without decent lives and that hamper the emergence of viable economies that can engage with and profit from the world economic system? Uh, for you doing your competition work, this is a relevant question to ask. What are the restraints can you find that are working in this direction to keep people without power out? And some of the answer for you, uh, there will be perhaps some enforcement initiatives you can do, but perhaps also some problems that you can't solve by enforcement initiatives, but you need a partner like the World Bank and legislative advocacy uh, to pinpoint uh, what are the barriers that are keeping the people that don't have power out. Uh, this slide will actually give you a better idea about how the points tie in with one another the human rights point with the market point. Uh, in many of your countries and adjacent countries, agriculture is the biggest source of livelihood. And in some of them, maybe many of them, you have about 70% of the people are getting their subsistence from agriculture. And yet, oh, and, Often it is the case that many of these people are in very deep poverty. I mean, this is where you find some of the deepest pockets of systemic poverty in the world. So look what happens to the poor farming people. Often they're women, incidentally, the women who are running the farm. They have to pay too much for their inputs. They are blocked on their output market. They can make what they're making cheaper than the rest of the world, and they can't sell it on the merits. So the UN has called for a more integrated thinking. Um, you can think in an integrated way about the problems. And then you can think about what is the source of the problem, can you solve them, how can society solve them. So, why are farmers overcharged for their inputs? It's usually fertilizer. There is potash is a big input into fertilizer, an important one. There is a potash cartel in Canada. I'm not thinking on Canada. This is this happens for every every country that like U.S. Uh, we have a law that protects Americans. We don't have a law that protects outsiders. So the potash cartel means 
the price of fertilizer when it's sold in the developing countries is going to be higher than a competitive price. Uh, there are other ways in which the